Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar this Tuesday. Um, we Today's session is going to be with respects to managing conflicts in strata corporations. And um, Elaine McCormick and Matt Fisher have done a partnership team kind of presentation, which I'm sure you are thoroughly going to appreciate. We are very grateful for their effort and the time that they've spent on creating this for you. Um, as we go through this, the webinar today, um, our target is 45 minutes. We will have some additional time for questions. Um, we won't be able to get to all the questions, but their email addresses are here, or you can reach out to any advisor and we can help source out information for you if you have additional questions. So um, as we go through the session, if you post a question in the Q&A, certainly I'll read it, we'll monitor it, try and group them together, um, but um, um, we'll try and address them at the end of the session itself. Um, the um, many thanks this week to Bramac, who is our sponsor. Um, our sponsors have helped keep all of the webinars going and we're very appreciative um, for all of them um, and their contribution and support. Little privacy update, just to remember, we've created the Q&A in such a way that participants can't see each other's questions to basically protect your privacy in case you put personal information into the Q&A. So um, that, those questions will not be retained or published at the end of the session or used in any way, but we still advise everyone to keep your personal information to a minimum. Um, if you um, are seeking any very specific answer on a problem in your strata, my recommendation is that you reach out to one of the speakers. Um, it's very difficult to answer questions broadly without knowing all of the particulars, the details, and the evidence. Um, and as a result, the what you have today in front of you is not legal counsel specific to an issue in your strata corporation. It's general information for educational purposes. This session is recorded, will be posted onto the CHOA YouTube website, as well as the presentation as a webinar, so you can come back and view it again, or you, you're welcome to um, send the link to any one of your colleagues um, to share it that way as well. So without any further delays, um, Elaine and Matt, you're on. I'll monitor questions and things in the background and um, in your presentation. Thank you very much for the generous introduction, Tony. I'm going to start us off you know, for the next few slides, and then Matt will take over the driver's seat for a little while. We're going to start off by talking about the objectives of this webinar. We're going to review the importance of proactive actions and communication in managing and preventing conflict. What I find is that a lot of times we want to avoid conflict. We're living in our homes, potentially when we're in a strata and we're sitting on council or we have bought a place maybe that is our dream. It is our getaway. And the last thing we want to do in those situations is deal with conflict. Same with non-residential strata corporations. You want to be able to go to your place of business and go home and not deal with conflict. However, there is going to be conflict in strata corporations. Things go well until they don't. And when they don't, you really do need to deal with the conflict. When conflict does occur, de-escalation strategies are essential for allowing owners' concerns to be heard without disrupting meetings and other strata activities. There is bullying and harassment. It's increased over the years. Definitely a little poll I took of strata uh, lawyers in the last few years, we've been feeling it as well. Just the amount of vitriol out there. So keep in mind in listening to our seminar, recognizing conflict does not create it. Avoiding conflict probably isn't an option. So we're going to have to talk about how to deal with it. And on to the next slide, Tony. Parties often involved in strata conflict, it's a group of parties. Often there's, there's um, different groupings, but it often involves owners, tenants, council members, occupants, service providers, employees of the strata, the strata manager, living caretakers. There's emotions and connections involved with all of these individuals. There's often personal relationships, professional obligations, volunteer obligations, the council taking on quasi-judicial role. You mix that with a bunch of gossip, 
potential financial obligations, which create some fear about whether or not people can afford it, some anger, and you have a pretty hot um, group for conflict. The uh, and, other thing I would like to just say is that the way the legal system is arranged in order for these groups to often seek relief dealing with any type of conflict, even if it's owner owner, the strata will be central to, will be centrally involved in any type of external dispute resolution. Sorry, Matt. No, no, I, and, and thank you. I think the important thing to keep in mind is this is not an exhaustive list and it can be further divided down because you may have factions between the owners and factions on council. It can get very complicated. It sure can. And even as a mediator, when I go into what are supposed to be the breakout rooms with people with the same interests, for instance, a council or a section executive, you find that there are interpersonal views, different relationships, different interests, even within what is supposed to be the united group. So a couple more conflicts before we go on to uh, stages of conflict. We'll talk about that before we go on to Matt's presentation. So looking at this, I think it's somewhat helpful to understand that there is a beginning latent stage where it's sort of under an undercurrent of it. And then it em emerges and you're pretty aware that there's a conflict, there's a felt conflict and it escalates. Without any real action, it'll stay at escalation or, uh, or minimum a stalemate. So unless you take some type of action, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly saying this as counsel, but even as, as an individual owner, it's not going to move from that. Uh, De-escalation, negotiations, dispute, settlement, conflict, aftermath, most of that is best done through negotiation, through mediation. The Civil Resolution Tribunal and the courts have really pointed out that they can deal with potential incorrect decisions or decisions that were made in the past or issues that are in the past. But for people with ongoing relationships, um, like strata councils and owners, you're really not going to get a lot of relief for that. So unless you have somebody moving, selling, forced to sell, the legal system, uh, the true um, legal system through civil resolution tribunal and court is a very awkward way to deal with uh, future or brewing problems. Do you have thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it's early intervention that's the key in a balanced and uh, mature way uh, that um, that really helps with these issues. But I think also, you know, there there is no one size fits all solution. Um, there are some times when adjudication is necessary and sometimes where it's completely unnecessary and just further divides the owners. And then there are the dramatic and unusual circumstances such as the the Vaughn shooting in in. Ontario, where a condo board um, was subjected to violence, um, and they knew there was a problem brewing with this owner. They were trying to resolve that problem, um, and they just didn't have the tools to do with it to, to deal with it. And I think part of it, uh, part of the purpose of this seminar, is uh, in response to that and and the general escalation of of violence and and acrimony, uh, to make sure that we give owners and council members what tools are available for them to self help, but also to help help council members and owners know when uh, when and where to seek assistance from others. That's true. And not all conflict is going to be avoided. And not all conflict is something that the council can, can stop from happening. For yeah. sure. So, uh, Matt, you were going to take us through some causes of conflict and then a scenario um, that we can sort of bandy about afterwards. Yeah, thank you. And and feel free to jump in anytime, Elaine. Um, in terms of causes of conflict, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but any lawyer who practices in strata laws, Elaine and I do, will see a lot of um, varied causes, but also repetition of, of causes where we see patterns emerging. Uh, strata managers see this as well. CHOA representatives see this as well. 
Um, and, and I'm just going to go through fairly quickly because time is short uh, on this seminar, but miscommunication can be a dramatic problem where, for example, a council president says something's not going to be a problem without going to the rest of the council or reviewing the bylaws, can set expectations uh, incorrectly that can then be a source of entrenchment where an owner has expectations based on a miscommunication uh, that can persist for a decade. Um, no communication is also a problem when people are allowed to fester in their own concerns without receiving communication or without having an opportunity to be heard by the council or by the ownership. Uh, there are also some personality types and some people who are not experienced to strata living who fail to recognize the strata has authority over their lives and the way that they use the property. They don't recognize the authority of the strata council to enforce the bylaws and they have to be educated about that. Uh, particularly, there's myths that circulate that for example, in a bare land strata, that the strata has little, little authority with respect to what happens within a bare land strata lot, which is not correct. It depends entirely on the bylaws of that strata corporation. So some educational aspects there to make sure that uh, the authority of the strata council and the responsibility of the strata council to enforce the bylaws is uh, understood by the ownership can be helpful, but that can be a cause for conflict as well. Unfair actions and behaviors, especially when it comes to use of property, money, or disparate uh, treatment by the council, um, can really build resentment. Um, casual or arm's length governance or overly strict or arbitrary governance are two sides of the coin. Casual or arm's length governance, where someone is in breach of the bylaws for a long period of time and the council takes no action to deal with it, or a strata council that jumps immediately to um, Maximum fines for every trivial bylaw infraction can be equally problematic. Uh, if the council's not enforcing the bylaws and someone's causing a disturbance or interfering with the rights of others to use property, that can foster conflict and create long standing uh, factional divisions within a strata or resentment or litigation. Uh, in contrast, Ignoring the, the ability of the strata council to provide a warning or time to comply with a bylaw or to have a less formal dealing with a minor trivial bylaw infraction, always assessing the maximum fine regardless of circumstance or whether it's a first infraction can be equally problematic. Um, unclear decision making or failing to follow process blends in with either no decisions being made or unilateral decisions being made where a council president, for example, is making decisions without going to the uh, strata council for a formal vote on a on a significant decision with respect to a bylaw infraction or anything similar, approval of an alteration, making sure that the strata council is educated with respect to how decisions are made, and uh, making those decisions clearly, documenting them in the minutes, following the correct process and procedure, and making sure that if a council member is in a conflict of interest, which we'll talk about, that they're recusing themselves to make sure that there aren't unilateral decision-making processes where uh, owners are left with the feeling that one person is the autocrat who decides everything for the strata corporation. And reflecting those that decision-making in the minutes can be really important so that owners understand what's going on. Um, exclusion of new owners or discriminatory exclusion by established community leaders can create uh, resentment. If the strata has different rules for new owners than they do for owners who've been there a long time or have special dispensations for long-term owners, that can be problematic too. Um, factional divisions can be extremely damaging to a strata corporation. Uh, I mentioned earlier, being unable to um, have, as an owner, being unable to bring your concerns to council or feel, have, feel that your concerns are being heard um, leaves owners with the feeling that they are only remedies are either self-help remedies by talking to other owners and trying to drum up support against the council or through litigation or other process. And that can be avoided by ensuring that proper channels of communication and bringing uh, complaints and grievances to the council uh, are available. I mentioned autocratic um, council presidents, you know, who do not document that they're getting decisions from the entire council with respect to how owners are being handled in terms of alteration requests or bylaw enforcement, that's important to address. And it's a, it's a clear cause of conflict in a lot of cases. On the, on the flip side, though, an owner who has unrealistic expectations uh, sends an email requ requesting and expecting an immediate response from council on something that they consider urgent that is really just important to them and not objectively urgent. Uh, or who email council on a daily basis when councils usually don't meet more frequently than monthly absent a true emergency. 
Uh, that can be grading on the council. It can create bad feelings on, among council members, and it can leave the owner feeling that they're not getting a professional response because they don't understand what a realistic expectation is in terms of council response. Uh, strata managers not responding at all or promptly, sometimes just an acknowledgement that something has been received and will be put in front of the council at the next meeting is enough to calm an owner who's concerned. Uh, personality conflicts, and the scenario we're going to present has lots of that, um, where those are being permitted to infect uh, strata communications or meetings uh, and distract and, and basically deter participation from more reasonable owners who just want to address the problems of the community and, and have the community be a pleasant place to live or uh, have their recreational property. Uh, division of interests or opinions, those are always going to exist in strata corporations, but it's a question of how they're handled. Um, and my focus throughout is really going to be, is, is there a balanced approach? Is there maturity, uh, emotional maturity and sound communication um, between the parties who can it be de-escalated? Are there resolutions where a compromise is possible? And is everyone being sufficiently patient? Because there are inherent frictions in a strata community that really... Um, can be resolved as long as they're recognized and addressed. Uh, one of the other things that often council grapples with and owners grapple with is if, if there's a large sum of money being approved for a repair or some other source of anxiety where an owner feels that they may not be able to afford a repair, that, that can take away an owner's ability to deal with um, an issue rationally or calmly. And it's up to council, I think, to recognize that those fears exist and try to mitigate those and address those, or at least acknowledge them in a meeting that, you know, we're all affected by this. None of us want this huge expense. Uh, that kind of language can be helpful. Uh, but the counterpart of that is sometimes we see owners faced with inflammatory or derogatory language targeted at them by a manager or by a council or by other owners. And even if it's from other owners, if the chair of a general meeting is allowing that kind of a communication to take place, disrespectful or derogatory language to take place, the strata can be responsible if they're giving that uh, person a, a venue to spout hatred, for example, or uh, to escalate a problem. And it's important that the chairperson be alert to calming the tone of meetings. Uh, one of the cases that I was involved in, uh, Mary, Lou, Mary Lou Mitchell case, involved a um, an owner who was complaining about the Strata Corporation not perfectly following financial obligations and reporting obligations. And the council and the manager got uh, annoyed, I think, with that communication and ultimately um, told her that any further correspondence would not receive a response. Well, it turns out the court didn't like that for two reasons. One, Mary Lou Mitchell was correct about some of the concerns that were being raised and was basically being silenced. And the other is, uh, it was seen to be a disrespectful and uh, inappropriate attempt to shut down an owner's uh, avenue of communication. So finding a way to have avenues of communication remain open, but also um, respectful is the challenge there. Um, I think it's such a challenge, Matt, because as yeah. a council, you're often faced with people that maybe are disrespectful. Mm. Maybe they've said horrible things at meetings, um, but yeah, they could be right about something. That's right. You could be right about something from a legal perspective and still be awful to deal with. And yes. as counsel and as lawyers, professionals, we have to keep focusing on our behavior and our responses <clears throat> and not focusing as much on what the other person is doing. And that becomes really difficult, I think, for counsels because it, it may be easier for me who can write letters, who can, you know, walk to Starbucks before I answer the terrible email. But it's a little bit different when you're getting out of your car and bringing in your groceries and you're faced with an owner who is up in your face telling you what's what, right? Yeah. And that's where councils sometimes fail in these human rights tribunal matters, in these civil resolution tribunal matters, because they're exhausted and tired of dealing with somebody's complaints. And they may not deal appropriately with the one valid one out of the 30. That's right. And with respect to the one valid issue, they can also become entrenched in who's the winner and the loser on this point without giving a thought to um, trying to understand the other side's position or reach a compromise. And, and that's quite common. People become entrenched in issues. And it's once entrenched, it's, it requires a little bit of effort to get them out of that position.
So the scenario that we're going to talk about, and there's a handout that I think that uh, that provides more detail just in terms of background for those who are interested, but I'm going to try and summarize really quickly. And we're going to refer back to this from time to time to time, a fictional account here of Tom and Carl uh, and their efforts uh, inadvertently to, to divide the Strata Corporation. Um, so Tom and Carl, in this scenario, they own adjacent townhomes and they've owned next to each other for decades since uh, at least 2012. Uh, things have become awkward. And basically, Carl lets his dogs out in the yard in the, his townhouse. They bark. Uh, Carl, uh, uh, Tom, Tom has migraines and he objects to that. He's complained to the council. But the first time he complained to, to Carl, it was angrily communicated. So um, basically, Tom approached Carl, uh, complained about the dogs barking. Carl noted that two dogs are allowed under the bylaws. Tom noted that unreasonable noise is not allowed under the bylaws. And uh, harsh words and uh, hand gestures were exchanged. That um, that resulted in a long-term series of complaints back and forth between the two of them. Uh, Tom and Carl continually complaining with some serious and some trivial uh, bylaw complaints, we'll say, uh, but some very serious. Um, for example, Carl at one point noticed his dog is feeling sick in the backyard immediately without any evidence or, or basis for the suspicion accuses Tom of having poisoned his dog and makes a complaint to council says something like this about that at a meeting. Tom is very uh, livid about how this is affecting him but doesn't get into specifics about his migraines. And so this conflict is allowed to uh, fester because they continually complain about each other but the council largely remains out of it they considered a, a, a dispute between owners that's none of their business, despite the fact that bylaw infraction allegations are being brought before council on a regular basis. In the scenario, we've got uh, Tom at some point is on the president, uh, on the council as president. He personally directs bylaw uh, infraction process under section 135 against Carl about the barking. He dominates the discussion at the hearing. He directs that um, basically the other council members are deferential to him because he's the president. They don't maybe have a full discussion on the topic. Tom does not recuse himself from uh, the discussion. Um, and uh, he also directs the manager in terms of the letter that goes to Carl. And the letter goes beyond even what council uh, talked about in that it says, basically, if it's, the situation is not corrected, there may be litigation to require the removal of these dogs. Of course, people react very emotionally when their uh, family members, their finances, or their pets are threatened. Um, Subsequently, Tom is not on council. Carl is on council, and he's the president. He refuses Tom's Tom permission to install a patio awning, which Tom thinks is retaliatory for his complaints about Carl's dogs. Um, never mind that the awning that Tom wanted was much larger than any had been pre that had previously been allowed in the strata. And then at one point, they're both on council, and nothing on council gets done because they're constantly squabbling. And the rest of council, they're conflict diverse, as many councils and owners are. They don't want to get involved. They don't shut it down. They don't participate. It just happens. But no other business really gets done. And essentially, council members start resigning. People start not wanting to serve on council. The manager resigns as well because litigation is threatened against her uh, under the circumstances where that letter um, was objected to by Carl. Now, if it's allowed to fester over decades, what ends up happening is sometimes you see factions uh, evolved. So a faction in support of Tom, they want to see no pets. They want to see strictly enforced and very strict noise restriction bylaws. In contrast, a faction starts to support Carl, and they're looking for a more live and let live community without uh, authoritarian bylaw enforcement and uh, having to look over their shoulder to see whether anyone might complain about uh, every trivial bylaw infraction. Because keep in mind, Tom and Carl are complaining about even trivial things. There may be some serious issues that are being addressed as well, but the, the culture of this conflict has become everything that they notice about the other becomes a complaint to council. So under this scenario, both Carl and Tom have started litigation in the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Uh, they've sued each other. They've named the Strata Corporation for failing to uh, sanction the other owner um, as a result of their own complaints. And the Strata, of course, has had a legal representation through their insurer with insurance deductibles that, that may accrue as a result, or maybe the insurer has stopped covering these disputes. 
Uh, in any event, um, there are expenses for the Strata Corporation to cover the legal uh, services that they're starting to need. And the context now is that a special general meeting has been scheduled. Um, a special general meeting has been scheduled to approve a special levy for legal expenses, and the meeting is expected to be very contentious. It's not just these two owners. It's not just um, their resentments and their friction. Now, there are also factions who see this as symbolic of the two different views of how the strata corporation should operate, strict bylaws and strict bylaw enforcement, or a more live and let live atmosphere. Um, and of course, in these cases, quite often, the silent majority of owners, they just want to live there. They don't want this conflict. They don't want these factional divisions. They resent the insurance risks. Uh, you know, they may have fears that insurance wouldn't be renewed or that deductibles will continue to go up or that there may be more litigation that may result in tens of thousands of dollars of expense. Who knows? It depends how many cases are brought and what they're about. And they're also grieving, I think, in many cases, in this case, under this fact scenario, certainly the loss of that well-regarded strata manager and the lost sense of community um, that, you know, used to be this uh, feature of the strata corporation. So you may be able to guess already, because I've hinted at them, what some of the common consequences of conflict can be. And there's no real limit. Again, not an exhaustive list, but you can imagine that some very uh, mild-mannered people sitting between Tom and Carl at the AGM every year might feel very unsafe if there's shouting going on, if there's, uh, uh, you know, threatening language used, or again, if the hand gestures and, and the swear words come out. So that makes some people very, very uncomfortable, very, very unsafe. It can deter participation at meetings. It can deter people from serving on council, and it can, can really harm the uh, administration governance and just the calm demeanor and, and enjoyment of living within a strata community. Uh, you may end up with proxy farming. And what that means is you may end up with both factions going around door to door and asking, or in some cases demanding that owners support them and provide their proxies. If they're not attending at a meeting, uh, they may uh, you know, fear monger or, or exaggerate the, the risks of not supporting them or not providing the proxy. And you'll sometimes see one owner, particularly you know, a vulnerable owner, um, handing out a proxy to both sides just to avoid the conflict. And then you wonder which one was signed more recently. Uh, you'll, you'll have problems getting people to serve on council. Um, you will have the inability to properly address strata business. That's clear in this scenario. Uh, including sometimes these things interfere with, uh, if the dispute is about repair and maintenance, sometimes you see important repairs deferred because people cannot collectively compromise on funding and approving necessary repairs. Um, so that can be a problem. Even if it's not about repairs, once a real conflict is allowed to fester, sometimes other votes start to become di more difficult to achieve just because of the friction and the uh, the the acrimony that develops. So uh, you will also see very frequently increased funding requirements because there are litigation and legal dispute expenses uh, that can result from these things. Obviously, even just the fact that there is litigation can result in insurance risks and expenses, uh, but it can fall beyond that. Even just the manager's time can result in additional billings if there is a strata manager who's having getting embroiled in more frequent correspondence beyond what their contract uh, contemplates. And of course, the litigation itself can have unpredictable results other than the expense that's likely to be accruing. Uh, fundamentally, communication starts to break down, people become entrenched in positions, people become uh, factionalized in the worst cases. Um, and it doesn't have to be as bad as the scenario I've described for it to be problematic for the Strata Corporation. I've picked a, uh, a scenario uh, and described it for you in one that's pretty bad, but it doesn't have to be nearly that bad to create dysfunction. And even hints of dysfunction in the minutes of the Strata Corporation can discourage sales, particularly if they're on a point that is of interest to a purchaser or if it's used as a negotiating uh, wedge in the purchase price of a Strata lot, uh, it can potentially impact property values. Um, at the, at the more extreme end, having uh, a dysfunctional council that cannot function as a result of conflict is one of the reasons that the BC Supreme Court has identified as a justification for a court-ordered appointment of an administrator. 
And what an administrator does is usually at about the rate of a, of a lawyer, they will um, cause the, they will take over from the strata council and govern the strata corporation if the court agrees that things are bad enough. And that can be very costly, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how long it goes on. Um, there are also potential liabilities, penalties and sanctions arise from arising from bullying, harassment, workplace conduct issues, uh, human rights complaints, and and things of that if they start to get tied into the, the friction and um, ultimately greater expense and outside decision makers having to weigh in on strata decisions. So it can be a, a sort of a long-term uh, conflict uh, scenario. Um, one of the, and, and, and Tony, I invite your comment on this, uh, Elaine as well. One of the issues that can come up is because some strata corporations are employers or they have independent contractors who uh, basically treat the strata corporation as a workplace. Uh, there, there can be an employment context uh, where bullying and harassment is recognized as a cause of action that can in involve uh, adjudication or litigation over um, a toxic work environment. And that can include verbal aggression, personal attacks, and other in intimidating or humiliating uh, behaviors. Um, and even if it's not strictly speaking an employment issue, uh, there is case law that talks about how, um, you know, the kind of atmosphere where a strata, uh, where owners are following around each other around with video cameras uh, to try and document uh, interactions can, uh, can be a problem. And uh, there's a CRT case about that as well. So these kinds of behaviors that... Um, people start to exhibit if they forget uh, the need to behave with maturity and calmness uh, can create liability for the strata corporation in all different kinds of contexts. And uh, Matt, I'll interject that a lot of this becomes a challenge for the civil resolution tribunal, lawyers that may assist strata managers because uh, the civil resolution tribunal is very focused on the provisions in the strata property act. And there are no specific provisions on harassment and bullying. So as lawyers, we look for provisions, we look for causes of action, we look for things the legal system, whether the Civil Resolution Tribunal, Human Rights Tribunal, or um, Supreme Court of British Columbia can deal with. And so we're looking to put this in other terms. And so when councils come to us with respect to an owner, for instance, harassing and bullying, uh, council members, um, we look to find a legal context and cause of action that will assist. And uh, that's frustrating for councils, for sure, and yeah. frustrating for owners if they feel that they are being harassed and bullied by council. Absolutely. One of the issues with the uh, Tom and Carl scenario that I outlined is in both of the instances where Tom and Carl were making decisions on council, uh, they should have remembered their duty of care under Section 31 of the Strata Property Act uh, to act in good faith with, the best, with a view to the best interest of the Strata Corporation. But they also should have, in that case, looked at the conflict provisions and whether they had a personal interest in the result of their complaints in the bylaw enforcement that differed from their duties as a Strata Council member, whether they should have recused themselves from that decision making. Uh, and I think that's an important point here. Um, next slide, please. So what can be done proactively? I think one of the biggest things is what I said at the outset, making sure that fair, consistent, and bylaw uh, and correct, procedurally correct, as well as legally correct, bylaw enforcement is undertaken. Making sure that different owners aren't being held to different standards, that there's fairness and consistency. Also knowing that there has to be uh, firm and uh, fair enforcement in the sense that ignoring bylaw contraventions because you're afraid of the reaction of an owner uh, isn't appropriate either because that just prejudices the other owners. Uh, knowing what bylaws are actually filed, council has a duty to know what the bylaws are. Don't enforce the bylaws that council wishes they had in place as opposed to the ones that are actually registered. And that ties into bylaws that are ambiguous, uh, where it's not clear what the expectations are. Council can correct those bylaws by you know, getting some assistance with preparing bylaws that are less ambiguous and going to the ownership and saying, you know, we need to clarify what the expectation is. But trying to enforce ambiguous or unlawful bylaws or bylaws that were not properly approved and registered, that can just be a huge recipe for conflict and legal problems. Um, and never ignore the less escalatory ways to enforce bylaws, warnings, time to comply where it's, you know, someone, it's just a matter of educating an owner as to what the expectation is. There are methods that do not create the same resentment that a, a fine will create 
if an owner just really didn't know and they are willing to comply with the bylaws, they just ignorantly uh, hadn't read the bylaws. So consider those less escalatory steps. Don't always approve the maximum fine. It's a maximum, not the de facto fine amount. Um, you know, make sure that you're documenting the decisions, how reasonable you're being in terms of enforcing the bylaws, and people are less likely to get upset about the bylaw enforcement process when it is necessary. Um, make sure that it's procedurally correct. Section 135 of the Strata Property Act is a complete code with respect to the steps required, and very many managers and, and council members miss steps or overly uh, simplify steps, such as not providing an owner with enough particulars as to what they've, they're alleged to have done wrong. Uh, and that's those are important steps. It, council needs to have Section 135 of the Strata Property Act in front of them when they are uh, enforcing the bylaws. And as was mentioned earlier, an owner can be annoying, but still correct. And it's important to remain calm and keep that in mind. Um, so enforce the bylaws you have, but also be aware that council members have to uh, give deference to the BC Human Rights Code where appropriate. And you may need advice on that in a particular case or where the guide dog, BC Guide Dog and Service Dog Act applies. These are circumstances and, and the breadth of the human rights code in terms of when it might be triggered and when, when it might not, too detailed to get into this seminar, but it's important to keep in mind that just enforcing the bylaws with rigidity is not enough. Council actively needs to engage, particularly if someone has said, you know, I'm unable to comply with this bylaw or this bylaw creates a discriminatory environment for me because I have a mental or physical disability or, or some other qualifying grounds for an exemption, as long as it doesn't cause a, um, an unreasonable hardship for the Strata Corporation. That doesn't mean that someone gets to ignore the bylaws altogether. They have to apply to the Strata Council and, and be granted an exemption, but there, there's a lot going on here that we can't go into in detail today. Uh, so in terms of um, other proactive steps, maintaining respect, uh, sorry, where are we? Uh, in terms of maintaining a professional and respectful tone in all communication, we talked about that. Uh, being sensitive to other viewpoints without being patronizing or dismissive. It is very difficult sometimes when council is busy to keep in mind that, that the tone of communication matters, but it does. It can really make a determination as to whether or not something's going to be a longstanding a feud or not. Uh, make sure that communication is, is invited both ways and make sure that owners have an avenue to complain to council or to get in front of council Section 34.1 of the Strata Property Act allows for that, and many strata corporations and strata councils try to deter hearings, whereas I see them as an opportunity to make sure that the owner feels heard, is given a fair hearing, and it gives them an avenue to, to express their concerns that isn't in litigation. So it, it, uh, it's very valuable, actually, to encourage those kinds of hearings. It doesn't have to be more often than council meets anyways. It doesn't have to be a long period for a simple issue as long as people are given a reasonable amount of time given the complexity of what they're addressing. Um, ownership can petition for a special general meeting uh, if they get 20% of the, um, the owners signing on. Uh, they can add an agenda item if they're feeling that they're not heard. These are not bad things. These are democratic avenues by which owners have a path to being heard or to raise concerns and they're valuable. They're not to be feared or resented. Um, and then if necessary, a dispute resolution uh, bylaw may provide uh, a, an avenue to discussing a problem uh, in a less adversarial way, or as, as a last resort, the civil resolution tribunal is there for a reason. So one of the things that I think is important to address is setting clear expectations. Uh, I mentioned earlier, an owner who emails daily may not realize that council are volunteers, that they only meet monthly. They may come from a a scenario where they own their own home in, in a non-strata environment, don't know uh, that, how council works, or they may be former tenants or current tenants who don't understand that it's, there's not a landlord on staff who they can, who they can uh, contact, that the strata council may meet monthly or even less often than monthly. So making sure that there are reasonable expectations that busy managers uh, may not be able to respond the same day, that the council in particular are volunteers who meet monthly at most, um, outside of a true emergency. And setting parameters on how owners communicate with the strata council or manager is also important. Um, and making sure that emergency responders are contacted if, if it's actually an emergency. Matt, I fear that your passion for the topic is a time. I know, sorry. Time. 
So yeah. I don't know if there's a way of uh, yeah, I can, I can uh, summarizing I can. the next few uh, because 10 seconds of slides is going to be hard. Yeah, sorry, I, I apologize, Colleen. <laughs> I, I think we can move on to your uh, slide 25. Um, I was just going to say in the next slide that a neutral chairperson is very valuable. That's in the slide materials, and the rest can, can be addressed through the slide materials. Oh, great. Sorry. So going back to slide uh, 25, and uh, obviously Matt and I are very passionate about this topic, and it's very difficult to fit it into 45 minutes. Um, but looking at hearings before council, whether under section 34.1 of the Strata Property Act or section 135, and considering um, any time you have a hearing before council, you need to set out a process. It really is important on to the next slide to have, uh, to give some real thought to how it's going to work. Uh, most people have not been involved in a quasi-judicial process as the decision maker. This is very difficult. Um, so it's best to spend some time up front considering how it's going to work, communicate beforehand, make sure that those participants uh, as council members are going to be able to set a respectful tone. Uh, the respect has to go both ways. If council doesn't set it, for sure the owner is like, unlikely to, to deal with it that way. Give the owner as much information up front as you can. Make it as comfortable as possible. Try a neutral place and normalize that this is hard. It is awkward for everyone. This is an awkward situation probably for an owner to come and ask about how they're gonna live in their place, how they're gonna deal with something to do with common property or some problem they have with another owner. This is hard, people feel threatened and it helps just to acknowledge it, it's difficult. The one thing I'd like people to remember after this is, is really as a council member, it's so important to stay curious and keep an open mind. You might hear something from an owner you would have never expected. Truly listen to the owner's concerns and somehow disassociate yourself from feeling threatened. This is an interesting problem to be resolved. It might be something you need to research. Maybe there is a way of dealing with the hardwood floors that deals with both the noise concerns of others and potentially the allergies of the person asking for it. So, it is also important for the owner or the tenant to feel as comfortable as possible. It may help to paraphrase a part of the submissions. Um, making judgmental comments is not appropriate. You're gonna ask the person to leave after you've heard them and asked any relevant questions and then deliberate afterwards as a council and provide reasons in a written decision. Certainly at this stage, providing a written decision is probably not enough. In accordance with the Civil Resolution Tribunal, you're gonna probably wanna give the, some, the person some reasons. Um, we're gonna skip through Azura, but it is illustrative of the idea that when you do notices for general meetings, they should be done in a neutral way. The council should not be creating proxies or dealing with things <clears throat> to really favor one side's viewpoint of a solution. There are times where a neutral third-party chairperson is super important. Kewa has some awesome chair people. Uh, they can assist with ensuring that everybody gets a chance to speak, that you don't have one person take over. And sometimes... You know, people try all sorts of different psychological techniques. <clears throat> Maybe it's the way they communicate with their family, but they can do all sorts of irrational things at meetings. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just hearing them out. Um, I had one owner who was very upset that um, people weren't taking her side of viewpoint. And she said, um, Maybe I don't know anything and I don't know what I'm talking about. And I said, just quietly, I said, well, that could be. And there was so much silence in the room. She hadn't expected that that just wasn't going to work in this type of venue. 
Uh, consider mental health issues. You may be dealing with somebody that does not have necessarily the capacity to deal with things appropriately. It could be um, that one or more owners may ask for a social worker to come and talk to the person. There is a very high level um, where the uh, you know mental health act can be involved, but it is a possibility. I've had security required in uh, arbitrations, in general meetings. <clears throat> there is a reason to have security. It is mostly to just calm things down. It does change the tone quite often. It is useful. One of the stratas I've uh, worked for from time to time was just used to the violence, right? I talked to the president about a meeting I didn't attend, and he said, oh, it went quite well. And then after we talked about it for another minute or two, he brought up that he had been hit in the parking lot in the back of the head when he walked to his car. And so people kind of get used to this almost in their own living environment, but you shouldn't. And it does make sense to have security either at the strata or perhaps you pick a venue that has some type of security component. There are times to call the police as well. So there are times if the, you, if there's the apprehension of physical violence, it is time to call the police. There are conflict management strategies on the next slide that you might want to listen to or look at at some stage, including active listening, empathy, problem solving techniques, asking people to, you know, take a moment out at a hearing if they need it, and educating council members with some of these skills beforehand, or even, you know, brainstorming how you're going to deal with it beforehand. Um, Contacting a lawyer, and, and what I'd like to emphasize here um, is earlier rather than later is something that Matt certainly brought out when we were talking, that sometimes a lawyer can assist with de-escalation. If your lawyer is assisting with escalation rather than de-escalation, you probably have the wrong lawyer. Uh, Matt, what would you say if the Tom and Carl strata came to you, the council came to you, not including Tom and Carl? Would you have kind of an outline of things you would deal with? For sure. I mean, part of it is fix the bylaws. Maybe, maybe Carl shouldn't have, maybe people shouldn't have dogs left in their backyards without the owner being present. And, and maybe there should be, um, you know, re reasonable expectations in terms of how what time of day the noise is before it becomes unreasonable. These, these sorts of things, there may be bylaw solutions, there may be communication solutions, there can be all kinds of de-escalation techniques that, that the council can use to try and keep the toxicity out of strata affairs. Um, yeah, absolutely. Certainly I've had situations where I've uh, stopped working directly, uh, stopped doing correspondence directly for the council or the individual owner because I have felt that the lawyer on the other side was actually escalating things. Yeah. And there are times when it's calmed things down. And in fact, the lawyers are actually part of the problem. But I believe that usually we're part of the solution. Well, and, and frankly, we can have a lot of tools in the toolbox. And sometimes it's being in the background, not communicating directly. And sometimes it's more valuable to be in the forefront. That's true. Um, and so I'm going to go uh, back, uh, go further on, Tony, and talk about mediation just for a few minutes. Um, so mediation involves an unbiased third party facilitating a discussion, brainstorming, helping to create a productive working environment between those people involved in the dispute. Even if it's an owner dispute, it's often important to have the council involved because the council may be part of any type of agreement. And, you know, mediations tend to be highly successful at dealing with at least some of the problems. Back when there was mediations, it was mandatory in small claims. There was, I guess, a success rate of somewhere between 60 and 65% in two hour mediations with people that really mostly didn't want to be there. And so that's really extraordinary um, given how long disputes can go on for at the Civil Resolution Tribunal and in court. And so it is something to consider. It's something more and more councils are paying for. 
And the other thing about it that is very unique is you're not looking at only dealing with the past. You're not looking at court orders that can only deal with those things that were before the court at the time that the court can issue orders on in accordance with the Strata Property Act or other le legislation. You know, the sky's the limit. The parties can agree on anything that's legally enforceable. Um, so that's amazing. And they can maybe come to a solution that they never planned on coming to. It, these processes are involved uh, or, or they can happen virtually. So I've had mediations being conducted using Zoom um, and the varying lengths of time, probably four hours is sort of a minimum but it really can be transformative for those people. And it gives people a chance to say what they wanna say and apologize, hopefully in a, a calmer, safer environment than you know, potentially a very divisive AGM. And of course, some very ch skilled cheer people like uh, Tony and Daryl, they, they, they do some of this actually at the general meetings, right? Um, but certainly, I, I haven't seen them manage to get people to actually sign an agreement at the general meetings about their disputes. Maybe, maybe you guys have, um, but it is something to definitely consider. Sometimes just an acknowledgement that the process has been hard, the idea of an apology, hearing what each other has to say is very helpful. We're gonna just say a few words about the role of arbitrators, tribunal members, or judges. That is a much more refined process where you need to prove certain facts. Uh, there are certain issues before that body and you need to ask for certain relief sought and that's the most you're gonna get. And it often does not address things moving forward. Of course, we've had a few extreme cases where Maybe it does, maybe after many, many court hearings, there are situations where an owner is, there's an order for sale or the owner is told to vacate the premises or something like that. But that is extreme. It often you'll find in the court cases, um, one court case creates another, one civil resolution tribunal case um, leads into another one for the strata corporation because you're probably only dealing with a little bit of the problem each yeah. time. That's a really good point. Before we uh, go to Q&A, Tony, can we just talk briefly about the Vaughn uh, situation that uh, just because it's received so much publicity and, and the mental health aspect, because I know uh, someone was asking if we could revisit the mental health issue uh, in a little more detail, because I did skip over that slide. Our, you know, we've all seen uh, frictions that escalate and we've all had uncomfortable situations at the very least at meetings. Um, and, the, and the courts in the CRT have basically upheld the council's right uh, to regulate that kind of conduct that's disruptive and uh, threatening. Uh, but is it is it a matter of knowing when to contact the police? You know, I, I got I got the sense from some of the materials on the Vaughn shooting after the fact and in, in the news that some of the owners reported that this had been an ongoing issue. There were suspicions that there were mental health issues at play. Uh, the owner uh, felt that they were above an electrical uh, system and there was a conspiracy to uh, murder them uh, through the use of the uh, items in the electrical room. This was clearly something where some kind of intervention um, should have been attempted if it wasn't. Uh, what are your thoughts, Tony, on, on that incident? Well, I think we have short memories because we have had um, fatal conflicts in our strata corporations in BC that long predated the Vaughan incident. And it's been between owners, it's been gang wars, it's been it's been individuals targeted at strata council members. Uh, and they're, they don't really ever grasp the headline because oftentimes there are long drawn out disputes that, you know, people start to ignore because they don't want to get dragged into these disputes. Um, but I think we need to look for 
all of the red flags that go up in our communities. Individuals who target other parties unfairly or they um, harass, target and slander and libel them um, to the point of trying to destroy their reputations. Um, I think when you find individuals who are behaving in inappropriate ways as a community, it's pretty important to step back and acknowledge you might need some help identifying what the problem is. You might need outside resources. You probably should be filing police complaints when these things occur so that you are on the record at the very least. It may require at some point some court intervention in the nature of restraining orders um, of some capacity. But, you know, we we had a, a circumstance of an individual in Richmond about 20 years ago um, who was assaulted in the elevator by an employee of the Strata Corporation. Um, and so this person then had to move out of the building because the, the Strata Corporation did little about it. The assault was actually documented. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that Strata Corporation failed to acknowledge there was a greater problem here because this person requested a hardship exemption to rent their unit out while um, the matter was being resolved and the Strata Council refused to grant the hardship exemption. You know, like there were, it, it, the decisions that we make as communities need to contribute to resolving problems, not to confrontation and conflict. And that's, and I think that's one of the issues, but everyone can try and second guess after an incident occurs, what could we have done better? But circumstances frequently occur where we have no warning signs when someone is going to act to such an irrational um, extent um, that this could have been prevented. You know, I think that's the other problem of, of taking the approach of, you know, this could have been prevented. What could we do to solve this problem or what could our community have done We're, rather than acknowledging that we do have um, people with mental health disabilities in our communities and how to work with them, we start to blame the victims, which is another problem that we, you know, our, it's our tendency is a go to what should we have done, right? Well, I'm, there are some really unfortunate and some really scary circumstances that have occurred to um, communities. A number of us have been exposed to them as well. And, and so, you know, I think you have to seriously acknowledge when a problem occurs or there's a threat or there is constant harassment or there's libel and slander and somebody's been targeted. Acknowledge it's occurring, get some help, and it may require legal assistance as well. But talk to your policing um, community office or your police department too and get some help and support because it's, you know, my own building, we've had to have um, police involvement with one or two people over the last 10 years. Um, but they've been really instrumental in helping to diffuse the problems and the conflicts in the building. Um, but don't forget, no matter what we do, if we end up with things like organized crime in our buildings, um, that becomes a much more serious problem. And we have very little control over it. Yeah. Thank you. You know, people need to know that they're not overreacting by taking whatever steps they can if, if they feel that there is a concern, right? You're not overreacting by holding your meeting at a hotel and hiring security if you're concerned um, that somebody is that, you know, comes drunk and it tends to be, appear to be violent, uh, you know, is going to show up. You're not overreacting to call the police in that instance. I've certainly been at meetings sitting down and have somebody drunk yelling above me. And, I, you know, I've been lucky that they've gone when I, when I have said, I'm feeling physically threatened by you and I'm asking you to leave uh, because they're a little surprised by somebody calmly telling them that. Um, but I don't think you're overreacting if you need to call a sheriff's office before you go into small claims court, if you're feeling that you need to do that and you want them to walk in from time to time. There does need to be some thought of how to deal with angry, vexatious, threatening individuals, and that may involve the police. So it's knowing when and how to de-escalate where that's appropriate and knowing when and how to escalate to a police or, or a court remedy when that's the only appropriate solution and how, how to do that. Well, and, and, and there and are maybe a bit about both, right? 
Yeah. yeah. And there are circumstances when you're in meetings. Um, you know, I, I know there are a lot of um, people who are really hoping that we go back to in-person meetings, but I have to say that the personal safety and security of electronic meetings has quite an appeal to for a lot of people, professionals included. I was I was the victim of a weapons assault um, 20 years ago up north. Um, that was an in-person meeting with an individual with a loaded rifle. And, you know, it, it, it was very happily resolved peacefully. Um, the weapon was surrendered. It wasn't specifically targeted at me, but I just happened to be at the head table. So I was the first um, possible victim that would have occurred. But, but, you know, instantly someone had the um, peace of mind, the sense of mind to walk out the back door and get the police right away so that the matter could be really de-escalated and resolved. And, and it was, but that could have easily turned the other way. Um, you know, that could have easily been a, a different outcome in that scenario. So you have to be observant um, and in this, this immediate necessity to render a decision on something often also creates conflict. It's, you know, we, we, you know, you have to solve this right away. Well, no, we don't. We're going to try and find a few resources and a few possible other connotations. But here's a flag that goes off, and this, this is the heart of a, really a great number of the questions on the presentation. Um, the flag that goes off um, is that there is um, an, a resident in the building um, who has a history of confrontation or violence um, with people. Um, and now the Strata Corporation and owners are afraid to ask for bylaw enforcement or to enforce bylaws um, because they're afraid of the consequences from this person. If, this, if you're at this point, you need outside intervention to help resolve this problem because this, this is not a community that's healthy any longer. One person is controlling your community. That's right. And Tony, and that that does happen. And so, you know, even then hiring lawyers, there's going to, uh, you know, be involvement then of individual owners, potentially swearing affidavits, sworn statements, maybe providing testimony in court. And that is very difficult to deal with um, when the person is living there. And it is difficult to obtain, um, you know, orders uh, that, uh, restraining orders when it's their their home and so we've gone to the extent of a being very careful even with order for sale proceedings where at times when there's been threats of violence we've had a bailiff come and uh, assist people move their things from the home and so there are ways of doing it and I think there are times when emotions are more heated than others and those may be the times where you really take special precautions yeah, it is a process and people need to understand that it's a process. It cannot be instantaneous, but there is the advantage that when an impersonal lawyer or professional is dealing with the situation rather than the council members who also reside in the building, it provides a little bit of distancing that can help protect the strata council. Yeah, um, we're well past time, but that's yeah. okay. Um, uh, thank you both. Uh, for your time and setting this up and creating it. I think maybe we might run this session again in the fall um, and maybe look at some of these scenarios that have occurred and maybe address them like case studies um, yeah. and talk about some of the other professionals and people that we deal with. You know, if you have um, a serious mental um, person with a serious mental health disability or a person who is aging and may no longer be competent to live independently, how do you deal with those issues? And and I think that would be a great topic for a fall webinar. The presentation um, slides will be on the website. The handout will be on the website and a recording. This recording will be on the website as well. Um, and we encourage everyone to share the information. Um, I think this is going to be a repeat with a slightly different topic as we get to the fall. So, so plan on coming back for us um, for that as well, Matt and um, Elaine. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, everyone, um, for your participation today. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but as you can tell, we even just have scratched the service on a number of these areas. Um, but feel free to reach out if you have additional questions that we can help you with.